Let's all take our Bibles, please, and open to Psalms 1. We're going to start the book of Psalms tonight. Let's go ahead and have a seat and open to Psalm 1, verse 1. Lord, we honor you as we look now to your word and pray that you would bless because we have received of your word. Lord, you give us the entire word of God, we know, to edify and strengthen our soul and transform our lives. So we look tonight with anticipation. Lord, we come with a hunger on our heart to receive of your word and to be transformed by it. And so we pray that you would be honored tonight by our hearts being poured out to you and by our soul being eager to learn from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the Psalms are such a magnificent uh, blessing that God has given to us. And uh, there are 150 of them, so we're going to take more than one a week <laughs> and just go through the entire book of Psalms and just be blessed in the studying of them. Of course, uh, many of the Psalms were written by David, not all of them. Uh, some were written by Asaph. Um, some were written by Moses and uh, others, but primarily David is the main author. And uh, right away you get David's heart for the Lord, and you also understand why David was called a man after God's own heart, because when David poured out his heart in the Psalms, you got right away, you get right away that he loves the Lord. And you know why God loves him, because of the love that he has for God. And I'm also convinced that when he wrote the Psalms, he, he didn't write them for any other reason than to bless the Lord. He didn't have a publisher in mind when he wrote them. He didn't you know, sit down one day and say, I wonder what I can do to uh, come up with something publishable. Maybe I should get an agent for these things. No, no, he didn't have any of that in mind. You know what he had in mind? I want to just bless God. And he poured out his heart in these psalms. Now, we know David was a musician, and the Scripture tells us that he was quite skilled as a musician, very gifted. And uh, so that giftedness in music really comes out in the psalms. Of course, they're, they're poems um, and, uh, and psalms. In, in Hebrew, it is the book of praises. Uh, psalms is really more of a Greek word than Hebrew. In Greek, it means a book of praises. And uh, yet it is, of course, praises as songs. So they would sing a lot of these, put them to, to music, play them with different things. And in fact, it's interesting, as you read through them, uh, various different instruments are recommended. Some are recommended to be on a stringed instrument. Uh, some are recommended to be on a flute or to be played with the accompaniment of some kind of a flute. And, uh, and they would have been very beautiful and moving. So when you hear psalms, they are to move the heart. The idea is that God has given these psalms through David and Asaph and others to cause the heart to be stirred within. And, and they do that. And they are encouraging. They cause you to want to come to the Lord with your heart and your soul to be poured out to the Lord. And so, you know, when you sing, your soul gets involved when you sing, your whole body gets involved. When you sing, uh, uh, it, is, it is such a way of pouring forth, pouring out. And so there you can understand there for that the psalms, the songs of the Lord, are given for that very purpose. Hey, you're supposed to do something from the inside. And you're supposed to, you know, oh God, pour out your soul in song, in worship, in adoration. And so many of the Psalms do that so beautifully. Now, they're poetry. And uh, poetry has an interesting um, revelation in Hebrew. It is different. Hebrew poetry is very different than American uh, poetry or, frankly, much poetry around the world. We, in our poetry, tend to rhyme with the sound. Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. And so it, it rhymes because of the sound of it, but it also because of the lilt of it. Roses are red, da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And, you know, you go, oh, man, that just kind of has a nice little lilt to it as well as the rhyme. But none of that is true in Hebrew. 
They don't try to rhyme with sound. They rhyme with ideas. And now what's glorious about the Jewish rhyming of ideas is that it's translatable into any language in the world. You, you know, you try roses are red, violets are blue in, in uh, you know, Greek, and it will sound like Greek. I mean, it, it won't sound like much. It won't, it won't resonate in the soul. But you can take Hebrew, translate that to any language, and it will translate beautifully because it's a rhyming of ideas. Now, in uh, the poetry of Hebrew, it is in the form of parallelism. That's the rhyming of ideas, parallelism, different parallels. And there are different types, all right? So if you're taking notes, I'll tell you the different types. You have the synonymous parallelism. That's where essentially the idea is repeated one after the other. So one idea is given to support the next one. That's synonymous. Another is progressive, where one adds to the next one, and they might add, and they might add, and that, therefore they might even be a, a climactic parallelism when it comes to a high point. You know, it's a glorious thing. Uh, there might be contrasting, where uh, the glory of the Lord is contrasted, for example, against man. And so you have contrasting. Uh, you might have a combination, kind of an eclectic parallelism. So when you go through, that's, that is part of parallelism. But, you know, you can go through and you can study and parse and figure out, okay, let's intellectually discern, is this uh, contrasting parallelism or is this an eclectic parallelism? And, and that's fine. I'm all into making sure that we understand the meanings of the thing. But if you only do that, you're going to miss out on the heart of the thing. You can open the Psalms in the middle of the night when your soul is troubled, and you don't care at all whether it's synonymous parallelism or, uh, you know, it adds one to the other. You just read those Psalms, and it blesses your soul. And that is exactly what God wants the Psalms to do, to bless your soul. Hey, you're going through a dark time? You open your Bible, and you read the Psalms. And they'll start blessing you. God will start ministering his word. He sends forth his word with purpose and with power. And when he sends the Psalms to you, he speaks to you words of comfort, words of encouragement. He sends to you words that will cause your soul to become alive. And that's the whole point. All right. Now, with that in mind, we read Psalm 1. By the way, uh, the Psalms can be organized in various books. There are like five books, you can say, of the Psalms. So we start, of course, with book one. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish." The first word in the psalm is blessed. How blessed. The last word in the psalm is perish. So this is a psalm that gives a lot of insight into how to be blessed and how to not perish, not to destroy your life. How blessed is the man. What does the word blessed mean? Well, uh, some suppose that it means to be happy. If you're blessed, it must mean you're happy. Um, but I don't think that's quite enough. That's not quite right. It's much more than that. To be blessed is to have the favor of God upon your life. That's really the best definition. The favor of God, which brings the joy of the Lord. The favor of God, which brings the joy of the Lord. You can be blessed by the Lord, and you can have the favor of the Lord in ways that, frankly, you may not even anticipate. Because God knows the best possible way to bless our lives. And he wants us to be in agreement with his ways. 
And right away you get the contrast to that. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Hey, if you're going to listen to the counsel of the wicked, you surely are not going to receive the blessing of the Lord. We need to understand how to be blessed. And he tells us, first of all, what not to do in order to be blessed. And uh, again, we trust the Lord. There's an aspect of faith there when it comes to being blessed of the Lord. We need to trust that God's way is right. You know, if you have kids, you know that to bless them means that you don't necessarily give them what they want. Is this not true? Now, all of the parents in the room are going to say, Yes and amen. This is exactly right. If you had a child and you gave that child anything that that child wanted, whenever that child wanted, would that child grow up blessed? Answer, no. You would end up raising a spoiled brat. Exactly right. So you look and understand, hey, if we in our human discernment can discern that, how much more can God, from his perspective from heaven, discern what we need in our lives. And so when God says no, he's actually blessing us. When God withholds something that is actually going to be harmful to our lives, though we may think we want it, he's actually blessing us. And so therefore, there's an aspect of faith, isn't it, of trusting God. There's also an aspect of perspective, because uh, one of the problems that I think we have is that our perspective gets kind of off. We get kind of skewed in our perspective, and then we start thinking that we're not quite so blessed. Why? Because we start comparing ourselves to others. And that's really a problem of perspective, isn't it? When you start comparing yourself to somebody else, that's a problem of perspective. Hey, from the way I see it, I don't have as much as other people seem to have, therefore I'm not very blessed. Although, all you got to do is go around the world a little bit, come back home again, and realize, actually, I changed my mind. I am quite blessed. I just didn't realize it. And so, you know, we send the kids, uh, our, our high schoolers, we send them to the orphanage in Mexico. And uh, they go down there, and they serve these disabled orphans. And uh, they minister to the community around them. And they come back home again, and their whole perspective has completely changed. Their perspective has changed, and therefore their understanding of their blessing has changed. And so really what we need is to have the perspective of God in our lives and understand that by faith, he surely knows how to bless our lives. So he tells us how blessed is the man who does not do these things. Now, there's a progression here. You see it right away. The man who does not walk, in the counsel of the wicked, who does not stand in the path of sinners, who does not sit in the seat of scoffers. So there's a progression. This guy is getting more and more comfortable with worldly things and worldly people. Now, first of all, one of the things we need to understand in the scriptures is that who we choose as friends, who we choose as associates, who we choose to hang out with has everything to do with how our lives will turn out. Did you know this is true? I mean, if you want to destroy your life, pick people who are destroying their lives as associates and friends, and you will find that your life will follow after. But if you want your life to be blessed and filled with godly growing in the Lord, find those who have the same heart and make those your friends. Hang out with them. Share the same heart and the same desire that you have with them and you're going to find you're blessed. But you see the problem? He says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So the progression is, the first thing is, the guy starts to listen to worldly people. He starts to listen to what they have to say. He's walking in their counsel. And then the problem goes further, because now he's getting more comfortable. He's standing with them, standing in the path of sinners. But now... He's sitting in the seat of scoffers. Now he's one of them. He has now joined company and become friends with scoffers, those who mock, in other words. They're mockers or scoffers of the things of the Lord. So progressively, they got further and further into trouble by making wrong friends and associates. What does the Scripture say? Bad company corrupts good morals. 
And therefore, parents, one of the number one job assignments that you have, parents, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch over your children so that you know who their friends are. And that you approve of those friends before they hang out with those friends. Now, that is something that I'm convinced that parents should do all the way through high school. If you love your kids, I think that's something that we should do all the way until they're flying the coop. Amen? And so, it tells us then in verse 2, but... His delight is in the law of the Lord. So right away, we're talking about something about this guy that's different. But if you want to be blessed, well, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Instead, verse 2, he delights in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. You might say, and in the word of God, he meditates. What does the word meditate mean? Well, the word meditate here is very different than the uh, Eastern idea of meditate. I remember I was teaching a class a number of years ago, and uh, this guy, who was quite new to the Lord, um, said, and he was a, it was an honest question, he said, do Christians meditate like Eastern philosophies and Eastern religions meditate? And I said, well, Christians do have an understanding of meditation, but it's completely the opposite. And I said, let me explain. In Eastern meditation, the idea is, you know, you get in this very uncomfortable position. And by the way, that's on purpose. You're supposed to be uncomfortable. You get in this uncomfortable position, and uh, you're, the idea of meditating is to empty your mind of all thought. And to, so you're, the whole idea is to empty your mind, empty your mind, think no thoughts, think no thoughts, to become one with the universe is to think nothing at all. And to help you with this, you have to make the sound that the universe makes. Now, does everybody know the sound? Did you know that the universe makes a sound? And so, it, you need to make the sound that the universe makes, okay? It would sound something like this. Oh, oh, oh. you know way too much about this. I went to church tonight, and we were all going, oh, it was the strangest thing. It was, wow. You make the sound of the universe, right? And the whole idea is to become one with the great nothingness. That's the whole idea, to become one with the great nothingness. To which we say, I don't want to become one with the great nothingness. I want to become in fellowship with he who created the universe. I don't want to become one with the result of the universe. I want to become one in heart and mind with he who created the universe. In order to do that, you don't empty your mind. You fill your mind. It's exactly the opposite. You fill your mind. You fill your mind. You fill your mind. What do you fill your mind with? You fill your mind with the word of God. That's why he says he meditates on the word of the Lord. And it would be very much like, uh, you know, if I had a glass... With, with muddy water, and let's say that that represents our soul. How do you cleanse that muddy water? Now, I, I used that illustration one time, and somebody came up afterward and said, well, you throw it out, that's what. Well, this, this is your soul, okay? So you, you can't just throw out your soul. What do you do? You add pure water to that muddy water. Your soul is cleansed and purified when we add the Word of God to it and we continue to add the Word of God to it. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, whatever is holy, the Scripture says, think on these things. And therefore, when we're receiving the Word of God, and we're here tonight, we are receiving the Word of God. It is like pure water coming into our soul. We're like drinking of water tonight. And it's just like ministering uh, pure life into our soul. We're just receiving that as God ministers his word to our lives. And it blesses us. So that's why when you get up in the middle of the night 
and you're troubled of soul, and you take out the Psalms, and you start receiving that, how blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and your soul starts to feel right. You are receiving because you're drinking of pure water. You're putting pure, uh, you know, you can say living water into your soul, the scripture describes. And so that's what he says. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And, and you get right away that the idea is to change from the inside out. See, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be changed from the inside. There's a lot of religion that tries to change the outside, and frankly, it doesn't work until the inside has been changed. You see, because in truth, whatever is happening on the inside will definitely affect whatever's happening on the outside. And so, therefore, if you really want to be transformed, then what happens on the inside is really the key to it, isn't it? And that's why I remember, of course, the days when, when Chuck Smith was starting Calvary Chapel and ministering to the hippies, and what they looked like on the outside, you all remember, wasn't much. I mean, right, the strangly hair and the be beards, you know, and all the clothes, and the, the outside, you know, and smoking pot, and the drugs, and the free sex, and, you know, all of that was part of a culture that, of course, needed to be transformed. But how do you transform that culture? Well, you don't come and say, hey, cut your hair, man. Cut your hair, man. You look like a hippie. Well, you are a hippie, but change, cut your hair. I mean, that's not the way to transform a person. The way you transform a person, as Chuck Smith and those who followed after have that same heart and mind is, hey, you teach the Word of God, believe the Holy Spirit, changes the heart, and what happens is when the heart is changed, then it begins to affect the rest of our lives. And that's what I'm convinced that the church is supposed to be about. I want to see a church that is filled with people who love God, love the Lord, love the Lord with our heart and soul and mind and strength. That's when the church is alive. That's when the church is the church that God wants it to be. That's when the church is effective in the community. See, it's, we shouldn't fall in love with the church. That, God loves the church. In other words, we shouldn't be bragging about how great our church is. We should be boasting about how great our God is. Amen? We need to be falling in love with the Lord. And so that's the whole point, changing from the inside. For surely what happens on the inside will affect what happens on the outside. Uh, here's an illustration of this. Back when, I was, um, back when I was a youth director many, many years ago, uh, we had this uh, group of guys that were really troubled, difficult, and uh, so I would kind of gather all them together and, and spend time with them and, and try to just, you know, encourage and build relationship. And so we, we'd go play basketball or whatever. And so we were down at the gym one time playing basketball, and we just did a pickup game with some guys that happened to be there. The problem was that the guys that happened to be there all had an attitude. So that uh, whenever, you know, they made a basket, they were getting, you know, like all you know, cocky and you know everything, and then uh, anytime we missed the basket, they'd be like, <laughs> you know. Well, the problem is our it our guys were just falling apart, and we were just getting destroyed. And and I could see what was happening. What was happening is is that they were just disturbed. The whole thing was just disturbing them. So I got them together and I, I said, guys, look, here's what's happening. They're disturbing us. They're they're just bothering all of us. And I said, here's my my thought. I've got a plan. What do you think of this idea? There's actually a scripture that applies to this circumstance. And they're looking at me like, okay, yeah, like what? And I said, how about the scripture that says, love your enemies? And, and I said, I think we should do that. I think we should love these guys. And they're looking at me like, come on, are you for real? And I said, no, no, I think we should love these guys because the scripture says that loving your enemies like heaps burning coals on their head. What do you think of the idea? And they looked at me like the spark came in their eyes. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. I said, so here's what I want you to do. What I want you to do is every time they make a basket, I want you to just clap and say, good job. And, and every time they make a good pass, I want you to say, hey, great pass. And just start encouraging them. Just start encouraging them. And, and, and I said, and then just have fun. So... We got back in the game, 
And that's exactly what they started doing. They started, every time they made a basket, we started clapping. Great job. And if they made a good pass, hey, good pass. And if they started like getting our face, we just shrugged it off and kept going, kept complimenting them and blessing them. You know what happened? They had no idea what to do with that. <laughs> and it completely disturbed their game, and we ended up winning the game handily. Yes. <laughs> but the whole point is, Look, they were disturbed. They were just totally disturbed in their soul. Say, so, hey, do you understand that when your soul is right, it changes everything about your life? The scripture says, the unrighteous one, his soul is not right. His soul is not right within him. We need to have our souls right within us. And God gives us this. Notice what it says, verse 3, and he will be like a tree planted by streams of water. See, right away you get this picture then of a life that the Lord blesses. He's like a tree. Now, the tree is a picture of strength. He's like a tree planted by streams of water. And the idea, of course, is that his roots run deep and just soaks in that living water. And of course, you can't see what's happening in the root system. All that's under the surface. And I think that's a great picture of the fact that the one who really does stay near the Lord and drinks of the living water. You know, people can't see how you really are in private. Nobody can really know, of course, but God. But the one whose roots and of course, no one can see, but they, in reality, go deep. And they soak in, they bring in living water. And he says, that's a picture of the man who's blessed of the Lord. He's like a tree planted by streams of water. It yields its fruit in season. And its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The favor of the Lord. Now, that's not the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is, is a, what I call a gospel of greed. That's, you know, hey, if you give $1,000 to the Lord, it'll give you a hundredfold back. And uh, That's not the idea here. The idea here is that the favor of the Lord, and I do believe in the favor of the Lord. I'm convinced that the favor of the Lord is on those whom he loves. Now, why would I say that? Because like a father loves his son and therefore puts his favor on him, God so loves us. Like a father loves his daughter, and therefore would put his favor on his daughter, so, a, uh, so God loves us, like a son or a daughter loved by his father. And so therefore the favor of the Lord is upon us. And therefore I am convinced that that's part of our faith. I do believe that the favor of the Lord surrounds us. And that the favor of the Lord is upon us. And that therefore we can walk in that confidence to know that God is with us wherever we may be and whatever we may doing, that God is with us in all our endeavors. Do you believe this? And it's important for our faith to get. And then he continues, verse 4, the wicked are not like this. They're like chaff, which the wind drives away. Okay, chaff is, of course, the waste that comes from wheat. So when they harvest the wheat, they beat out the kernels. But then the kernels have the husks and stuff on them, you know, so they would beat them and rub them and all that stuff to get them pure. And then what they would do is they would throw them up into the air so that on a windy day so that the wind would blow away the chaff. And he said the wicked are like the chaff that the wind just blows away. Drives away. Therefore, verse 5, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Verse 6, I love, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous. See, the Lord knows the way. The Lord watches over your steps. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. Do you believe this? The steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. And it says that the way of the wicked, though, will perish. That's my faith. I believe that. I trust in that. I stand in that. Now, Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is what we might call a messianic psalm. 
because it's filled with prophecy of the anointed one, of the Messiah. Therefore, it points towards Jesus Christ, and in many ways, prophecy yet to be fulfilled. Notice what it says. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So against God, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, and his anointed. His anointed there means his Messiah. They say, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in the heavens laughs at this. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. So the Lord Jehovah here is saying that he will install his king. Right away we see it's prophecy because he's speaking of his anointed, his Messiah, Jesus Christ. I will surely tell of the decree of Jehovah. When your Lord, the word Lord is in all caps, L-O-R-D, all caps, that's the word Jehovah or Yahweh. All right, so that's important to understand as we go through the Psalms. I will surely tell of the decree of Jehovah. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, this is the prophecy of that God is giving to his Messiah, Jesus. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. Now, uh, some mission organizations like to use that verse as kind of their theme, but it wasn't given for the purpose of missions. It was given for the purpose of declaring that God will cause the nations to be given to his Son that they will in a future age and time be given to him as an inheritance, for he will rule over the earth from Jerusalem. There is a time yet to come. The kingdom age, which we read about in Isaiah and Ezekiel and other places. And just as a reminder, in case you're not familiar with the various aspects of the end times, there is, of course, the cross, There's the church age in which we're now living. That's the age that believers are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Then as you move towards the last days, you have the tribulation period, and of course the rapture of the church just before that. And then at the end of the rap, or excuse me, the end of that seven-year period, and of course there's many details about that, at the end of the seven-year period, the Lord Jesus himself returns to rule and reign upon the earth for a thousand years, the kingdom age, the millennial reign of the Lord. After that, then comes the final judgment, new heavens and a new earth, and eternity, you know, to come. So that's it in a nutshell. So this is talking about the kingdom age, when the the Lord himself will rule from Jerusalem. And he says, I will give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possessions, and you shall break them with the rod of iron. In other words, his rule will be firm, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship Jehovah with reverence, and rejoice with trembling. Do homage, pay honor to the Son. Now, right away, we understand then that the Son of God is the Messiah. Therefore, when Jesus came, and we're going to study this in the book of Matthew, when Jesus came declaring that he was the Son of God, they understood right away what he meant because they knew the Psalms and other prophecies. So when Jesus declared that he was the Son of God, they in fact got it right away and they were offended because they said, you are making yourself equal with God. They understood it, and it was for that reason that Jesus was crucified, which we're going to understand. Back to our Psalm 2. Worship the Lord, do homage to the Son, verse 12, lest he become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath will soon be kindled, and how blessed are all who take refuge in him. I love 
that last verse. How blessed are those who take refuge. He is our hiding place. He is in whom we run. The scripture says that the name of the Lord is like a high tower. The righteous run to the Lord and are saved. Psalm 3. This is a psalm of David that David wrote that when he was running or fleeing from his son Absalom, you might remember that David's son Absalom at one time led a revolt where he won the hearts of leaders and he won the hearts of the people against David. And he was very clever in how he did it. Uh, Absalom was a very good-looking guy. Scripture says he had long, flowing, curly hair. And he had a manner about him that was very influential. And he would stand at the gates of the city and greet people as they were coming into the city. And he would greet them. It's a friend, come this way. If you have any complaint or any concerns, let me know. Because no one has, uh, David has no ear for anyone's concerns, but I do. I have an ear for your concerns. Tell me your concerns. And he would therefore bring compassion and made it look like he was a caring, concerned guy. And in so doing, he began to win the hearts of the people over to himself. And at one point, led such a revolt that David actually was fleeing from the city of Jerusalem, not knowing whether he would live or die or ever return to reign again. This was Psalm 3. O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no deliverance for him and God. They were, they were even throwing this as a taunt or an insult against David. David, of whom God's hand had blessed over and over, victory upon victory. And now they're saying about David, there's no help for him and God. But he continues, but you, but thou, O Lord, art a shield about me my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and I slept, and I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have smitten my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Now, one of the things that we love about David is his faith. His relationship to God of trust. David never turned to idols. David never turned away from the Lord. He always had his heart for the Lord, even though David sinned, and David's sins are famous. But he always had his heart toward the Lord, and he always had a faith to trust in God's help. Even though David blew it, even though David was a sinner, nevertheless, he always turned to God for help. And that's one of the things you got to love about David. And you, you see here in Psalm 3 his faith that arises, the confidence that he has for the Lord. He states the problem. Lord, look at my adversaries. They're increasing. They're rising up against me. They're even saying that there's no help for me in God. But verse 3, but it doesn't matter what they say. For you are a shield about me. See, that's my, that's my faith. You're a shield about me, O oh Lord. That's my faith. I believe that. You are my glory. You're the one who lifts up my head. Now, we can understand shame. Shame makes a man, uh, you know, put his head down. I'm ashamed. And you put your head down like this. But the Lord comes and lifts up your head. The Lord is the one who lifts up your head. And so David, in another place we're going to read, says, I lift up mine eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? I lift up mine eyes to the Lord to receive my help. God is the one who lifts up my head to receive help from the Lord. See what he says? I was crying to the Lord, and he answered me. I lay down and I slept, which means I had peace. I went down and I slept. And I awoke because the Lord is my sustainer. The Lord is the strength and my sustainer. And I love verse 6. you got to love verse 6 because it, just, it makes you just want to arise up 
and, and just be strong in faith. David writes, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. I will not be afraid when great numbers, I'm outnumbered by ten thousands of people. I will not be afraid. Why? Verse 7 tells us, because he turns to the Lord. Arise, he calls out to God for help. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For he, and then he remembers, don't forget God. You are the one who have smitten my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. And, and David means that. He remembers and knows that David has had many encounters with enemies. And the strength of the Lord has been with him over and over and over again. You get this picture of David's uh, uh, strength, you know, of, of uh, someone's teeth, you know, kind of flying out of his mouth, you know, as the strength of that, uh, of, that, of that blow. And he said, you have shattered the teeth of the wicked, for salvation belongs. Now, salvation here means rescue. doesn't mean only soul salvation, but here it means help. Saving me from trouble. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. I love that. That's hope. That's faith. You see, we can call out to the Lord. We can even use the Psalms to call out to the Lord. And, and God loves that when you call out to the Lord. Hey, when you're in trouble, here's the thing. When you're in trouble, and that trouble is even your own doing. Okay, here's the thing. Follow me now. You call out to the Lord when you're in trouble, and that trouble is your own doing. And in fact, your own decisions have made such a mess that it almost seems hopeless. What do you do? Because you, you could easily look at that and say, I made this mess. I don't deserve any help from the Lord. At all. I made this mess. But nevertheless, the Lord wants us to call out to God for help. Call out to God for help even though I made the mess? Yes, absolutely. But why? Because he wants you to be a man or woman of faith even now. See, yeah, you got your mess because of the decisions. And I mean, I've made, believe me, I've made messes myself. So I'm, hey, believe me, I'm not trying to make myself higher here than anybody else. But I can tell you this point, and that is that I will call out to the Lord, and I have called out to the Lord, even though that some of the things that I did were my own stupidity. I nevertheless am going to call out to the Lord for help because I know that He is my helper, He is my salvation, and that the Righteous are going to run to the tower of the Lord, and he will be our helper in time of trouble, even if that trouble is our own doing. Hey, it's my faith, and that's what I'm going to stand on, because I have seen it over and over and over. I know that he is indeed the God who loves to save, loves to rescue, when we turn to him for help. It's such an important thing to, to grasp, to never let go of. God, I call out to you for my help, and I know that he'll help me. One of the things that um, I get to do, of course, as a pastor is to pray with people when they're in trouble. And one of the, the pictures that God has given is the picture of, of standing in a field of weeds. And I remember talking to a guy, and uh, he was relating to me every bad decision that he'd possibly done that got him to this point, and, and, I, and I had this picture in my mind. I said, you know what I see? I see you're like standing in this field and there's nothing but weeds around you. But these weeds are things that you've planted. You planted all of these weeds. And now you're just, you're just surrounded by weeds. And I said, now you're probably, you're of course wondering, how do you get out of this field that's nothing but weeds? And I said, here's the answer. Here's the answer. Number one, stop sowing Weeds. Number one, stop sowing weeds. Don't sow anymore. Number two, start sowing good seeds. Start making right decisions. 
start walking in the way that you should walk. Now, I said, here's the thing. When you plant seeds that are good and godly, you do that by faith. Because when you first plant seeds that are good and godly, you don't see a lot of results right away. You're still living in a field of weeds. Are you with me? But this is what I do know. If you stop sowing seeds of weeds and you start sowing seeds that are good, good will come. You keep walking in faithfulness and you're going to see that you will reap a harvest that's good. Right? Number three. Here's the next thing you do. Number three is that you ask the God, you ask the Lord for the steps in which you should take. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All we have to do is follow. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. God, what are the steps that I need to take to get out of this field of weeds? What are the steps that I need to take to get me out of this trouble? You start turning. You start calling out to God for help. You start asking for the Lord, and he will give you the answers, and he will give you the help, and he will begin to direct the steps that you need to take. The Scripture says that the, Lord, the word of the Lord is like a lamp that lights the way before us. And so what we need to do then is to have the way before us lit by the Word of God, the principles of the Word of God will help us so that we can begin to walk in that faithfulness, and we will see that when we walk in faithfulness, God blesses faithfulness. And you will see that if you keep walking, even though today you can't see it, today all you can see are all the results of these bad decisions, but if you will now have faith, I can assure you because I have seen it over and over and over again and I know God's word promises it and God's word is sure that if you would trust the Lord now and walk in faithfulness, he will help you out of these troubles. Amen. And I love David's heart because David knows this. And David relies on this, and we're going to see David's heart in this over and over. He trusts in God to be his help, even though this problem was his own doing. Nevertheless, he turned to God, and God was his help. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that we get to receive now from the Psalms. They truly bless us. Lord, we look forward to that blessing. We look forward to what you want to do in our lives because you want us to increase in faith. You want us to increase in blessing. Lord, you want us to increase in hope. And therefore, you give us your word to direct our steps that indeed we would receive and be blessed because your word has marked our way before us. And so, Lord, we honor you tonight as we trust in you. Church, tonight as we're before the Lord, here's my question. Are you in trouble? You in trouble? Because if you are, God has an answer. And it begins with calling out to him and trusting him even now. Will you trust him even now? Would you just raise your hand and say, Lord, I need you to be my help. I need you to be my deliverer. I call out to you even though the troubles may be the troubles that I've made with my own decisions. But Lord, I ask that you be my help, that you be my deliverer even now. I call out to you. God, you know every heart that's represented by every hand lifted. And you know every concern, you know every trouble, you know every difficulty. And Lord, every one who calls out to you is calling out to you in faith. Blessed be your name, for you indeed are faithful to your word. We trust you now in it, in Jesus' name. And everyone said...